So let's look at why we might be reaching a speed limit for microprocessors. Now to do this, we need to understand something about how microprocessors are made and how they work. And for this, I'm going to need a volunteer. Uh, let's have you. Yes, you might come on down. Okay. If you'd like to stand just there. What's your name? Joe. Joe. Okay. So a microprocessor is a really big electrical circuit with hundreds of millions of tiny switches. And to understand what they're all doing, we've got a simple example. So what we're going to do here is we're going to make a milkshake. And if we succeed, this light will come on. Now, to make a milkshake, obviously, we need milk. So what I'd like you to do is to close this switch by moving that lever down. OK? Now, the light hasn't come on, so obviously we don't have enough ingredients yet. So let's suppose we also have some strawberries. Would you like to close that switch? OK, and the light comes on. So if we have milk and strawberries, we can make a strawberry milkshake. OK, let's suppose we don't have any strawberries. Can you open that switch for me? And let's say instead we have some bananas, if you'd like to close that switch. So again, if we have milk and we have bananas, we can make banana milkshake. OK, let's suppose we have strawberries and bananas. So if you want to close that switch again, and the light stays on, of course. So what this says is that to make a milkshake, we need milk and we need either strawberries or bananas or both. Now, that kind of reasoning is called logic, and computers are very good at it. Now, the logic circuits in a microprocessor are vastly more complex than this, but the principle is just the same. They're based on switches, which are either on or off. OK, thank you very much. Now, obviously, mechanical switches such as those are much too slow. We need a way to make fast electronic switches. And the key to this is a remarkable substance called a semiconductor. Now, a semiconductor is something that's partway between a conductor, like copper, which allows electricity to flow very easily, and an insulator, such as plastic, which doesn't allow electricity to flow at all. And it's that in-between property of semiconductors which allows them to be switched very quickly between being an insulator or a conductor and back again. Now, in fact, the very first semiconductor was discovered here in the Royal Institution by Michael Faraday back in 1833. He was experimenting with a material called silver sulphide. This is actually quite a familiar material. I have here a silver tankard. As you can see, it's all nice and shiny. But if we leave this lying around for a few months, it becomes covered in this black tarnish. And that black tarnish is silver sulphide. Now, Faraday discovered that silver sulphide is a semiconductor. And in his notebook, he described this discovery as very extraordinary. But of course, he had no idea of the huge practical impact this discovery would have over 100 years later. Now, in time, other semiconductors were discovered, such as germanium and silicon. But the big breakthrough came in 1947 with the invention of this. This is called a transistor. And we can think of this as a very fast electronic switch having no moving parts. But how does a transistor work? Well, to find out, let's see how we can make a switch using water. So here I have a, a tank containing water, and we're just going to build up a little bit of pressure in this tank. So the water's now under pressure, and it would like to flow up this tube, along this tube at the top, through this valve, but this valve is closed at the moment, and then down into this collection container. Now what I'm going to do is to allow some of the high-pressure water to flow into this cylinder, and it will move the piston and then open the valve. So let's see that happen. So this is now flowing into the cylinder, pushing on the piston, opening the valve, and we can see water flowing into the container. And if I turn the tap back and release the pressure in the cylinder, the valve closes again and the flow of water stops. So we've used water pressure to control the flow of water. Now water pressure is a bit like voltage in an electrical circuit, and the flow of water is a bit like electrical current. So in a transistor, we use a voltage to switch on and off an electrical current. 
Of course, real transistors are much faster than this. A real transistor can switch in the time it takes light to travel just a few millimetres. Now here we have a model, a cross-section model, of a transistor. And this has been magnified 10 million times. So on the scale of this transistor, the whole processor would be the size of Greater London. <laughs> OK, so how does this work? Well, this is the silicon layer at the bottom here. And on the top, we have three copper electrodes. Now, this electrode is connected directly to the silicon. And so electricity can flow in through this electrode, through the silicon, and then out through this electrode. This is a layer of insulation. And on top, we have a third electrode. Now, by applying a voltage to this middle electrode, we can switch the silicon between being a conductor, in which case electricity can flow from here across to here, or being an insulator, in which case no electricity flows. The insulation is important because it stops electrical current from flowing out of this middle electrode. And in a modern microprocessor, that insulation layer is just four atoms in thickness. Now, at first, transistors were packaged individually. And I have here a circuit board from a computer that was built in the early 1960s. And you can see each of these silver cans is one separate transistor. Thank you. Now, the next important development was called the integrated circuit. And here we can see an example of an early integrated circuit in which four transistors have been manufactured on the same piece of silicon. Now, in time, people made integrated circuits with more and more transistors on that same piece of silicon. First 10, then 20, and so on. And that was done by making the transistors smaller and smaller. Now, Gordon Moore, who founded Intel, noticed that the number of transistors on a chip seemed to be doubling every two years. And that's become known as Moore's Law. And that's continued to hold for the last 40 years. The next generation of processor will have several billion transistors on each chip. Now, microprocessors are manufactured on the surface of a thin wafer of silicon, and I have one of them here. I hope you can see this. Each of those little squares is a single microprocessor of the kind that we saw earlier. Now, to me, it seems incredible that something which is so tiny and so complex can be made at all. It sounds almost impossible. Well, to see how it's done, we're going to have a go at doing something else which also sounds impossible. And for this, I'd like a volunteer. Should we have someone from this side? Yeah, I bet you. Would you like to come on down? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Let's come and stand here. That's good. What's your name? Briley. Briley. OK. Um, what's your initials? B what are your initials? BG. BG. All right. I'm going to give you a big marker pen. There we go. And I have here some rice, just ordinary rice. I'm going to take a little grain of rice. And I'm wondering, do you think you could write your initials on the side of that <laughs> grain of rice using that marker pen? Probably, uh, not. probably not. No, I think probably not either. OK. Tell you what, to make it a little bit easier, we're going to do something different. Just wait there a minute. What I have here is just a sheet of plastic. What I'd like you to do is to write your initials, nice big writing, nice big fat writing, across the middle of that plastic for me. OK? Excellent. OK, that's good. Do you want to just go over that one more time? Make it really nice and big and fat. That's it. Lots and lots of ink is really good for this. Excellent. Wonderful. OK, that's brilliant. OK, let's just pop the top back on there. Now, what we're going to do with this, if you'd like to come with me, I'm over here, if you'd like to stand just there. We're going to take this, and I'm going to pop it in this frame, like this. And I'm going to switch on this light box. So this is just a box with a bright light inside. So lots of light is coming out. It's passing through your initials and spreading out in all directions. And over here, we have a lens. And the lens is collecting some of that light and focusing it down onto this grain of rice. And we also have a camera, which is looking at that little grain of rice as well. And if we can now take the feed, if we can take the feed from that camera and bring it up on the screen, if I keep out of the way of the light, we should just, there we can see, there are your initials written on a grain of rice. Okay? Okay, let me do one more thing. Hold out your hand like this, 
and put it in front of your initials, in front of the light box, that's it, and then hold it flat like that in front of the light box, that's it, and now just move it gently about, and we can see <laughs> an image of your hand. Okay. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So to make a microprocessor, we can lay out the design of the processor on a large scale and then use a projection technique just like this to shrink it down to a very small scale. So we've seen how to project an image down to a small size, but how can we use this to make a microprocessor? Well, here I have a piece of a microprocessor that's partway through being manufactured. In fact, it's just the transistor that we saw earlier. And we're going to see how to lay down, how to create those three copper electrodes. And to help us do this, we have two workers from the microprocessor factory. OK, and uh, we'll find out in a minute why they're dressed in these strange costumes. So how are we going to make this microprocessor? Well, at the bottom here, we have the, the layer of silicon. And we've already put down the insulation layer. And the next stage is to lay down a complete layer of copper across the whole surface of the wafer. And then on top of the copper, we put down another layer of special material that's sensitive to light. The next thing we then do is to project an image of the copper wiring onto the top surface. So if you can bring on the light, please. So this pattern of light is the pattern of copper that we want to create on the surface of the wafer. Now the light is causing a chemical change in the material in this top layer. OK, we can switch the light off now, please. And the next stage is to wash the wafer in a special chemical that dissolves away this green layer. But it only dissolves the material that wasn't exposed to light. So if we can just remove these two pieces now, please. Excellent. OK, so the next stage is to wash the, wafer, wash the wafer in acid. Now, acid dissolves copper, but it only dissolves the copper where the copper is exposed. The copper that's underneath these green regions is protected. So let's add our acid and remove those two pieces then, please. Good. And now the final stage is to use yet another chemical to remove all the remaining green layer. So if you'd like to remove those two pieces, and I'll give you a hand with this middle piece. OK, so now we've created our pattern of copper wiring. And if we just bring that light back on for a moment, we can see that the pattern of copper corresponds exactly to the pattern of light. And we can do this for the hundreds of millions of transistors on the microprocessor all at the same time. Now, all of this has to be done under incredibly clean conditions. In fact, it's 10,000 times cleaner than an operating theatre. Now, to see why, imagine that just one speck of dust got into the optical projection system. We'd get an image of the speck of dust. Now, on the scale of this transistor, a speck of dust is 100 metres across. So if we get an image of a speck of dust instead of an image of the wiring, we've ruined the circuit. And that's why Alex here and Elaine are dressed in these rather strange looking suits. They're called bunny suits. Is it hot in there? Boiling. It? Yeah, it looks really hot. <laughs> so these suits are not there to protect the workers. They're there to protect the microprocessor from any dust which they might bring with them into the factory. OK, we'll say thank you to our volunteers and join me again after the break.